This presentation and video have been prepared by Select Plantire to explain the difference between anti-collision and zoning, how the systems work, their shortcomings, how to maximise productivity, possible faults and how to minimise them, supervisor systems, what they do and what they can give to site, any options available when dealing with non-tower crane plants such as crawler cranes, mobile cranes, piling rigs, concrete pumps and so on. The screenshots you see are from SME ProSite, but the theory should be the same for most anti-collision systems available on the market today. Now it's about 18 minutes long, so I suggest you pause it and get yourself a drink now. Select Plantire have a fleet of tower and crawler cranes, primarily in the UK, Middle East and Australia. We have a full range of sizes, and in the UK we have a large quantity of high-capacity flat-top and luffing jib tower cranes with capacities of up to 66 tonnes. Whilst we cover all types of sites, we specialise particularly on tall and complex jobs such as the Shard, the Leadenhall Building, Battersea Power Station and the Shell Centre. On multi-crane sites such as these, sites must have controls in place to prevent a collision. The primary method of doing this, according to BS7121 Part 1 and Part 5, is the use of a project appointed crane coordinator to plan the lifting to avoid a collision and use tools such as crash radios, spotters and anti-collision systems such as those provided by SME or AMCS. Now regarding those anti-collision systems, BS7121 Part 5 states these devices are a useful aid to the operator when operating on multi-crane sites, but should not be relied on exclusively in place of operator vigilance and a safe system of work. Zoning is used to limit the area in which the hook block can pass. For example, it will prevent the hook block from passing over a road or railway by limiting the slewing and trolleying or luffing motions of the crane. Anti-collision is used to prevent two or more cranes coming into contact with each other's structures or ropes. In both instances, the systems have to be set up by a train technician. In order to prevent the hook block entering a zone or colliding with another crane, the system needs to control the crane's motions. To do this, it has to know the stopping distance of the crane. Bear in mind it cannot stop instantly. It has a slowdown distance. A crane stopping too quickly will put unnecessary stress on the mechanisms the crane's structure and base, and introduce a swing into the load. The slowdown distance is measured on installation of the system by the technician. They'll measure the angle for the crane to slow down from full speed slewing with its maximum load at its maximum radius, and do similar for luffing and trolleying motions. This slowdown is used to ensure the crane can be controlled effectively and safely by the system, and is illustrated as the amber zone on the image above. In addition to the slowdown, a buffer zone is added around the whole structure of the crane. This is for safety and allows for mass deflection and load swing. The system is constantly monitoring the slew and trolley or luffing motion of the crane with relation to obstacles in zoning or other cranes in anti-collision. So for zoning, when the crane approaches the zone, the system compares the current speed to the slowdown angle and will intervene by cutting gears until the crane is in first speed. It will then allow the crane to, to slew in first speed until the buffer distance reaches the zone. The driver can then only operate motions which take the crane away from the boundary, or safe motions. Most modern systems have a full colour screen which shows the crane in relation to the boundaries and other cranes. It will display the motions being restricted as it approaches another crane or boundary. The screenshot on the top right shows the driver's screen. The left and right arrows il illustrate slewing and up and down arrows are for trolleying out and in or luffing. The arrows will turn from green to amber on approach and red when the motion is cut. As the crane slews, the slew right indicator turns amber when the system intervenes to slow the crane down. It turns to red when no further motion is permissible. Safe motions are shown in green. It will only allow the crane to move away in full speed.
Here we have a crane placed next to a boundary. If the offload point is on the top of the screen, as the crane slews round towards the boundary, it must luff up in order to navigate past the zone. It's worth noting that any crane placed close to a boundary will be speed limited a lot of its time, so placement is critical for an effective site. A couple of key points we should consider. The system does not know the size of the load on the hook. The system does not know the deflection of the crane with that load. The deflection can be significant, especially on a tall crane. The buffer zone is critical as it accounts for the size of the load and the deflection. If the load and the deflection is larger than the buffer, then there is a possibility of the exclusion zone being breached or for a collision with another crane. Another key point is that the system does not know the height of the load on the hook. It could be a beam or a large shutter on long chains. Because of this, it will not normally allow a hook to pass over any part of the structure of another crane. How anti-collision works. When a crane approaches another crane on site, the system will, is constantly checking the speed of the cranes against the slowdown angles. It will intervene and start slowing down both cranes when the approach zone is entered. Eventually they will both be restricted to first speed and then stopped when the buffer zone is reached. Again, only safe motions are permitted so they can slew and trolley or luff away from each other. This illustrates two cranes slewing towards each other. When they are in approach zone, both cranes are speed limited. The amber arrows show the motions towards each other that are limited. In this case, the upper left crane can still luff or trolley as it does not affect the other machine. So here we have two cranes working close to each other. Remembering the system does not know the height of the load, as the left crane slews, its motion is cut. The only safe motion is to luff up and slew around the other crane. Even if the left crane were 50 metres higher than the other crane, the operation would be the same because the system has to assume there could be a very long load under the hook. In certain circumstances, on the shard for example, where there was a 100 metre height difference between the cranes, we were able to allow a load to pass over another crane structure by measuring the input from the hook height indicator. The system will prevent a load passing over or alongside a counter jib too. There's usually a boundary around the structural parts of the crane where the ropes cannot enter. In addition, remember the approach zone where the speed is limited. So here, as the crane slews round, it slows down and is stopped as usual. So the buffer zones will meet now. So if we slew that crane out of the way slightly, and then slew the upper crane round, it too will stop when the buffer zones meet. All further movement is now blocked. The system does know the dimensions of the crane. Here we can see the detail entered onto the system. So it will allow a crane to pass under the structure of another crane, obviously allowing for the buffer zone. This illustration shows a luffing jib luffing below the counter jib of a second crane. This would still work if the right hand crane were much taller. OK, some key points to bear in mind. When two cranes are working close to each other, the speed is limited on both. The size of the slowdown and buffer zone will limit the performance of the cranes. There's a critical point here. Remember that slowdown was measured on installation. If the technician couldn't do it properly at the time or is rushed and a compromise was made, there will be an effect on the crane's performance throughout the project. It's vital to allow enough time for the system to be properly installed. If the buffer zone is too small, there is a potential for clash. This is especially significant if there is a large load, so it needs to be carefully supervised and manipulated by banksmen with taglines. Placing cranes too close together will limit their performance or even stop them working effectively. Careful placement of loading bays and careful planning of loads is critical to a productive site. 
If the loads on two cranes are being placed too close together, both cranes will have limited performance. Finally, if the site is very tight and the cranes are very close together, there may not be an alternative other than to have the system as passive. That is, that you're only giving visual and audible warnings to the driver and not cutting any motions. If this is the case, then all the lifts need to be very carefully managed and a crane supervisor should be in permanent attendance. Now some common faults. Cranes in anti-collision communicate with each other via radio link. In many instances the free channels are used, but in busier towns and cities these channels can be congested with other radio traffic such as minicabs. If the system cannot get a clear signal it will fail to safe which will prevent the cranes working effectively. One solution to this is to buy a dedicated frequency from Ofcom. If there is any interference on the channel, Ofcom will then investigate and resolve the issue. So if the system loses communications with another crane, what does it do? An older system would instantly block out an area equivalent to the full slewing area of the crane because it does not, does not know where the hook could be. But newer systems are slightly more effective. So in this example, we'll see communication lost on TC1 on the top left hand side. An exclusion zone will appear around the crane, which will enlarge as time goes on, estimating where the hook could be within that period. If communication is re-established, the exclusion zone would instantly vanish. Another possible fault would be for the sensor values to change. This would fool the system into thinking the crane was in a different position to where it actually was and could result in a clash. A simple way of checking the system calibration is to set a test point at a fixed position on site, for example by a chain store or a gate post and so on. On older systems this could be done manually at the corner of a zone where the crane cuts out, and sure it cuts out in the same position every day. This clip shows setting a test point. You simply select on the menu and you add the test point. You can have multiple ones. If we slew the crane away from the test point and then click to do a test, so you tap on the test point, you click check position, here it's failed because it's in the wrong position. If I slew it back and then do the check again, it's successful. These results are recorded in the telematics on the system. The driver has a few options on screen such as night mode which dims the screen plus some view settings. They also have access to diagnostics and operational data. They have the ability to add test points as we've seen already and working points which help the driver repeatedly return to the same position by giving on screen guidance. The driver is not able to add or change any zones or alter the anti-collision settings they're only able to turn the zoning and anti-collision on or off. This is known as bypassing or shunting the system. This is usually done with a key switch located in the cab or occasionally at the base of the crane. When the system is bypassed, there should be a flashing white light which usually is usually located below the cab. This is to warn all operatives on site that the crane has no restrictions on its working position. The system cannot stop the crane, only give audible and visual warnings to the driver. Operating the bypass should only be done with the correct controls in place. This usually requires permission from site management. Often the bypass key will be located in an office. Newer systems allow the bypass to be operated from the supervisor system or an app with a secure login. Here we can see an app which is turning off zone G1. The driver still has the zone displayed on the screen but it, the green shading indicates the hook can now enter the area. Supervisor systems have been available for many years and are becoming more sophisticated. The latest systems allow for quick alterations to be made to all the cranes on one scheme, such as the addition of a zone. It will allow the zones to be switched on and off, 
and the zone which is switched off will still be displayed on the driver's screen but he will be able to pass over it with the hook. Site drawings can also be uploaded which will give the driver a full frame of reference. It's also possible to activate and deactivate cranes centrally, such as a crane which has been dismantled or is out of service, though the latter needs careful consideration. It will also have a full wind monitoring system if sensors are fitted. The wind is displayed on each crane and a central record is kept in the system's memory. All the systems have a central memory called telematics which records the crane's data, wind data, test points, bypass operations and zones been enabled, deactivated, added or deleted. Additional features how to manage crawler cranes, mobile cranes and other obstructions on site. Is it possible to fit a non-tower crane with an anti-collision system? The short answer is yes, but it's not simple. Tower cranes usually either have a fixed position or a restricted movement on tracks where the position can be measured. For other plant, the position could move and there's currently no reliable way of measuring the position of the crane accurately enough, though this may change in time. If a piece of plant has a fixed position on site for a long time, it may be worth considering installing an anti-collision system, but bear in mind it will take some time. Another easier solution would be to add a temporary zone around the plant using the supervisor system. There's three different ways of outlining the zone. Either use the crane's hook and store the positions, use coordinates, or using the mouse. So here on the supervisor system, we select add a zone. We're going to give it a name. And then we're going to outline the zone here. My fingers, the mouse. And then we store it. And will appear on the driver's screen in a matter of seconds. One point to consider with the supervisor system is the level of access for each user. The system is protected. The initial setup can only be altered by an installer. Below the installer there are more basic levels of access. Viewers can view the system only and download reports. A user can add their own zones and switch them on and off. There is then a hierarchy with several levels of access. Each one is able to add and remove the zones set by themselves or users with a lower level of access. The higher levels of access could allow the user to deactivate a crane, but only with the correct training and safeguards in place. Finally, the supervisor systems will allow several different reports to be generated. This includes hours of operation, movement, slewing area, that sort of trail showing where the cranes have worked over time, intensity of drawings, and also wind reports, amongst others. The data can also be downloaded in CSV format, so it can be manipulated to produce site's own reports. So in summary, under BS7121, on a multi-crane site, a site-appointed crane coordinator is key to preventing a collision through careful planning and the use of aids such as crash radios, spotters and anti-collision. Remember, anti-collision systems are currently an operator aid. They are not currently classed as a safety system. Ensure you allow enough time and space on site for the system to be set up properly when it's installed. Plan the zones carefully. Remember to allow for load swing and deflection. Consider buying a dedicated radio frequency for the anti-collision system to help guarantee reliability. And also consider using a supervisor system to switch the zones on and off centrally, to manage the interface between tower cranes and other plants, and also oversee the crane operation itself. Many thanks for watching. We trust you have found this presentation useful. Please check our website for other useful information and resources.